My name's Jonathan Little. We're here for a little coffee. Oh, I need a little bit of coffee today, that's for sure. I am tired. I have gotten almost no sleep the last few days. Um, stayed up late on election night, stayed up late last night, stayed up night, late the night before. So anyway, here we are, having fun, ready to run it back. I've been spending a lot of time recording the Tournament Masterclass. You can see the Cash Game Masterclass here, which is just included in Poker Coaching Premium. Make sure you check out PokerCoaching.com. You want lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of educational poker content. Let's see. Everything seems to be slightly off today on this uh, program. Hmm. Hmm. It's as if someone has changed my settings on my computer. That's not good. It's never good when they change the settings on your computer, is it? Such is life, I suppose. Today, since I um, kind of scatterbrained, we're going to be discussing clarifying your thoughts. And what do I mean by this? A lot of people have no clue why they do what they do. They just do things. They think they're supposed to do it. They do it. There's a lot of um, tribalism currently happening on people in social media. To be fair, I think everybody generally stuck at home has had their brain ruined by uh, being stuck at home for a long period of time. But it seems like everyone or many people are either not thinking for themselves at all, they're just regurgitating what they hear on social media, or, or they are just like doing nonsense, right? And, like, I'm all for relaxing and goofing off and whatnot. And to be fair, maybe that's just what people are using social media for. But, I think you want to have clear ideas for why you are doing the things that you are doing so that you can figure out if the things that you are doing fit with your goals in life, right? Like, um, for example, say your goals in life are to be a medical doctor. Let's just pretend. Well, going to law school probably won't help you, or um, dropping out of school and becoming a professional poker player probably isn't going to help you, right? So you want to make sure you really clearly define what you want in life, and your thoughts and your emotions and your reasonings for things will impact that to some extent. All right, let's see. So how do you go about clarifying your thoughts? The reason I even thought about this question today was because, or this topic today, was because someone said to do a little coffee on being a prolific author. And I'm like, ah, a lot of you don't care about being an author, I don't think. So instead, we're going to talk about what writing will very much help you do. If you write down your strategies or your principles or the things that guide you, you can go back and reference them. And getting these things out of your head and onto paper are going to go a long way to making sure you fully understand what you are actually doing. And it turns out if you can write something down in a clear way that somebody else can read it and understand, that's going to allow you to find holes or flaws in your strategy. When I wrote my first book 10 years ago now, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, Volume 1, there were a few things that I, I recognized while I was going through and trying to write down my strategy that I did not know. And if you don't know something, you have to go figure it out, right? Like, let's say you want to become a doctor, but you don't know where to even start. You got to figure it out. Otherwise, you'll certainly never become a doctor, right? So you want to make sure that you have your thought processes relatively clearly defined and your strategies clearly defined. That way you can find spots where there are flaws in your strategy and now here, you have to make sure you are not egotistical. So many people get it in their minds that I know what I'm doing and what I'm doing must be right. Whereas I think a lot of the people who succeed the most at life approach the life from the point of view of I don't really know what I'm doing. I need to learn from people who are doing better than me to see what's working for them and what's not working for them. And it turns out if you learn from others' successes and, perhaps more importantly, others' mistakes, that's going to go a long way to ensuring that you don't make the same mistakes they make and ensure that you 
you know, succeed in the ways that they have already succeeded. I mean, pretty much everything we have in this world today is uh, because we're standing on the shoulders of the people that came before us, right? And if you completely ignore that or don't make good use of that, you're wasting your time to some extent. Let's see, here we have a question. This is not an ask me anything, so don't start typing in all the questions. You've been a winning player your whole life, maybe 10 big blinds per hour. Well, I would hope you know that. You finally got in a 25 buy-in bankroll at 1-3 and immediately went on a 14 buy-in downswing and you're devastated. All right. First things first, right off the bat, if you've been winning for your whole life 10 big blinds per hour, why do you only have 250 big blinds? You're telling me you only played 25 hours in your life? Is that right? 25, 250? Yeah, 250. You only played 250 hours in your life? It's not very many hours. Okay, so if you only played 250 hours, you have to presume you very easily could be running hot. You say here you went on a downswing. Is that normal or do you just suck? If you only played 20, 250 hours of poker in your life, I don't know why you would have any idea or any reasoning to think that you must be a good, strong winning player because 250 hours is nothing effectively, right? I mean, I've gone on like a year-long downswing, and so has every other good player whenever you're playing things like tournaments. In cash games, eh, you can... I think whenever I was playing cash games back in the day, I had roughly two break-even months a year, which, you know, break-even's fine. But, I mean, in those periods, you certainly will go on 10, 15 buy-in downswings. That's just normal. Um, in reality, though, it seems like you're dealing with a very, very small sample. Small sample is very, 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 very relevant. Okay. All right, all right, all right. You retired this week. Congrats. Good job. Hope you enjoy your time being retired. I'm trying to determine what to do next. Well, I mean, you got to figure out what you want, right, Marcus? I mean, retirement can mean different things to many people. A lot of people, I think, when they get retired, they just want to do nothing for a while. But after doing nothing for a while, they're like, okay, I'm ready to go do something. So find a passion. Go do whatever you want, right? You can do whatever you want. You might as well make the most of your time. Shout out to Jabon for cashing for 4700 bucks the other day. Part of the Poker Coaching Study Group. Definitely check that out. Right after the show, 10 a.m., Louis Philippe will be running the Poker Coaching Study Group. You can get in that at uh, pokercoaching.com. Click on the Community tab. Go to the Discord, and you'll be right in there. You have 20 years of experience, just never had, you never had a bankroll. I mean, I, I don't really understand what you mean by you think you're... So look, Urban Hero, you're not going to like the answer to this. It sounds like you haven't treated poker seriously at all because you've not grown a bankroll. You don't keep accurate results. Because if you said you played 20 years and you've made $100,000, right? I mean, let's get out a calculator real quick. Okay, get out a calculator. You've, let's say you've only played one three. Bring up this calculator. Uh, you all can't see it. Let's say you make 30 bucks an hour. Let's say you play only, only 100 hours a year, okay? That means you're gonna make 3,000 bucks a year. You said you've been doing this 20 years. That means you should have 100, I'm sorry, you should have $60,000 from poker. Where in the world did it go? Did you really spend $60,000? That was you only playing 100 hours a year too, two hours a week, which is like nothing. If you play one three, for 20 years, making 30 bucks an hour, you will have $60,000. Where in the world did it go? I can tell you what happened. what's happening here is you're not winning nearly as much as you think, and you probably just caught a, um, caught, a, caught a downswing. You see we have a cash game masterclass. We have a tournament masterclass too. Not yet, but it'll be up in about um, a month. It'll be up by the end of November. It's giant. It's gigantic. Um... If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, if you poke around the site, you may be able to find the first few parts of it. When I say the first few parts, I mean only like the first 20%, you know, the first 30 videos or whatever. <laughs> um, so if you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, poke around, see what you can find. All right, let's see. Glad Fun Champions are joining Poker Coaching Premium. Does risk premium apply to the early middle stages of the tournaments? Not really. I mean, like very little. Sean says, you bought a house. Congrats. Ship it. Ku says that there's a chance that uh, Urban Hero is winning as much as they say they are, but they're just spending everything they win. Sure. You know, like, look, if you win money, but you literally spend all of it, you spent 60000 bucks over the last 20 years, why would you care if you go on a small downswing? You said you went on a 15 buy-in downswing. 
What is that? That is uh, $300 times 15. You've lost 4,500 bucks. Why in the world would you care if you lost less than a tenth of your winnings? You know what I mean? It's like this question just doesn't, it doesn't make logical sense. And this is why it's important to clarify your thoughts. This is the purpose of today's talks. You want to look at your results and say, all right, I've been playing poker for 20 years. And again, I assumed Urban Healer is playing like no poker, two hours a week. Two hours a week is nothing. I want to make that really clear. Two hours a week is nothing. If you're playing less than this, then you are like definitively a recreational player. All right. Two hours a week you're playing. You've made $60,000. Why would you care if you lose 4,500 of it? That's just part of it. It's hard to go on a 15 buy and downswing at live 1-3. I would actually completely disagree. It's really easy to go on a downswing at 1-3 because most players lose at 1-3. How did I like the high stakes feud between Negrano and Polk? I thought it was good. I mean, it's interesting to see both the players nice and um, being nice and friendly on the show. It, it kind of goes to show you that whenever people get behind an internet, they become very different which is why you should not assume that the world is as bad as social media makes it out to be. Because it turns out when some people get on social media, they lose their minds. That said, I thought Negreanu played pretty well. I've um, actually been going through um, some of their hands. They'll be going up on YouTube over the next few days. So make sure you check that out. Um, going through comparing their strategy to GTO. Turns out both players are um, deviating uh, some. Um, I think Negranu was doing a lot of checking with very strong marginal made hands on the turn to induce bluffs, which is probably a good strategy because it seemed like Polk was over bluffing. Um, we found a few spots where Polk was definitively over bluffing. So if anything, it's like Negranu's checking a little bit too often with hands that he knows he's not folding. And um, Polk is over bluffing. So if Polk, Polk is over bluffing, then obviously Negranu's strategy is just like a good exploit, right? Why do most players lose at 1-3? Take a second. Think about it. Figure it out. This should be very logical to you. Hello from Poland. Do I know some Polish poker players? Not off the top of my head, but I'm sure if I use Google, I would. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Massive plus EV being part of the Louis Philippe study group on poker coaching in the Discord. I, I completely believe it. Finding a good study group is very, 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 very valuable. All right, why do people lose at 1 3? Because they rake a ton. They rake a lot of money at 1 3. If every hand they rake $5, and you're going to play, what, 30 hands an hour? They're taking $150 off the table. Okay? Let's say everybody sits down with 300 bucks and there's nine people. That's $2,700. Okay? That means over the course of 18 hours, they literally rake away every dollar on that table. Every single dollar that started at that table, they're going to rake away over the course of 18 hours. Okay? So... If you compare that to something like a 5, 10, no limit table, let's say everybody buys in for $1,000, same 100 big blinds, you know, but they rake that same $150. Now we have $9,000. How long does it take away to rake, rake away $9,000 if they take 150 an hour? It takes 60 hours. That means at the high stakes games, you get to play, well, the rake is just substantially lower proportionally, right? It's important to recognize that, that the rake is giant in small stakes games. So your goal as a small stakes player is to get out of the small stakes ASAP to where the rake is much more manageable. Thanks for doing all the recent hand reviews. Oh, you're very welcome. Glad you're enjoying them, Manny. You love the videos. I've improved your game. Well, glad to hear it, Sarah. I'm glad to hear that all my work has helped all of you. You'd love to see an interview with Zhao Vieira. I would too, actually. I should probably try to line that up. I like him a lot. All right, let's see, let's see, let's see. Is this the same for micro stakes online? On some sites, I know Party Poker just reduced their rake in the micro stakes games, which, you know, if you're gonna play micro stakes, I think Party Poker's probably the place to play if you have the option. But pay attention to the rake. I mean, this should be obvious. Why are you not winning so much money? Because they're raking you infinite, right? But live stakes are similar to $50 no limit. In terms of skill level, probably 510. <laughs> in terms of amount of money you need, well, I mean, that's very different, right? You need almost no money to play 15, 15 no limit online, like what, 5K? Give you a solid 100 buy-in bankroll. 5K is not enough for 510, though. All right. 
fun champion. We've been talking about the tournament master class all, all session so far. He must have just arrived. It's going to be coming out soon. It's going to be very, very long. I'll tell you how many sections are in the flop because I have it on my computer right here. Let's see. Where is it? Flop section is um, about 35 videos long. 35 10 minute to 30 minute long videos. That's the flop section. It's pretty big. So 35 parts to the flop section to make sure you understand how to play the flop. Let's see. Um, what's the pre-flop or the, the uh, pre-flop section? Let's see. Where is it? It's so big. Um, 48 sections pre-flop. 48 5 to 30 minute videos pre-flop. We have ICM section, other topic section. It's going to be a little bit too much for everybody. I maybe uh, overdid, overdid myself here. When's it releasing? It's releasing at the end of the month. If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, though, I think if you poke around the site, you may be able to find parts of it already. So anyway, I'm excited that that is coming out. So it's going to be part of Poker Coaching Premium. How do you adjust your range for the rake? You play tighter. Especially if no one realizes you're playing tighter. You should play tighter. That's, that's how you win. Let's see. How do I feel about my 5-1 to one bet? I think it may be 4.5-1. I don't know exactly the odds I got. I'm forgetting at this point. I made the bet a while ago. How do I feel about my bet on Negranu? Um, I feel pretty good about it. I mean, I, after watching them play, it seems like he played reasonably. I'm not going to, like, up the stakes or anything or, you know, buy out. Because, I mean, you got to presume Polk's going to have a decent edge, especially once they play online. If anything, Negranu's going to have a decent edge live. That said, I think if you reverse the cards, I don't think the results would be all that different. From there, 200 hands live. You have to understand, 200 hands live is not a lot. All right. What do I think about team poker? I don't even know what team poker is. What is the? How big is the edge difference live versus online? You're going to have a much bigger edge live compared to online. How do I feel about tipping in small stakes cash games? All right. I mean, look, this is a personal preference, a personal choice. I tip literally every hand I win unless it's like just the blinds. When I'm playing cash games. However, that's me. I'm not trying to win as much money as possible from poker. Let's say, though, I'm just going to give you an example, and I'm going to let you figure out what you would do for yourself. Let's say you know you're going to win 15 bucks an hour playing 1-3 no limit. Okay? On average, let's say you win four hands an hour. Do you want to give away a dollar a hand? Seems reasonable. But if you think about it, you're giving away 25% of your money. $4 divided by 15 is slightly more than 25%. So do you want to give away 25% of your income every year from poker? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It's up to you to decide. But it uh, sure feels dirty to give away 25%, especially when they're already raking you a bunch, right? It's a tough spot. It's a tough spot. Do I have a preferred solver? Pio solver and Munker solver by a mile. When running hot, do you feel like susceptible to take a chance and play outside of your bankroll? No, why does running hot have to do with anything like that? That should have nothing to do with that. All right. <clears throat> Doug Polk over bluffs, but is that better than under bluffing? Depends on your opponent's strategy, right? If your opponent's doing a lot of checking and essentially setting you up to over bluff, then no. If anything, you want to under bluff. If your opponent's going to overfold, then yes, you want to over bluff. And I do think in general people do overfold. So I like the idea of being overly aggressive in general, but not if your opponent's going to accurately adjust. I mean, don't tell them, but one of the reasons I've had good success in high stakes tournaments is because I actually implement this Dale Negreanu strategy a lot against the um, young, overly aggressive players who will bluff very frequently when you check to them. So all you got to do, take your marginal hands, check them, and then don't fold them. I actually went through one of his hands recently in the, in the solver. It's going to go up on YouTube over the next few days. And there's a spot where Negreanu, like, in theory, should fold two pair on the river, like, half the time. But I'm telling you, I'm literally never folding one pair on the river against a lot of the people, right, who are overly aggressive. And that's because you shouldn't if they're overly aggressive. You, that's, that's how you exploit overly aggressive players, by checking in and letting the bluff. Why do we go all in with relatively weaker hands? according to GTO and call with the better hands, because the better hands are, they don't need protection and they want to keep the opponent in the pot. They make more equity by keeping the opponent in the pot. Also, um, 
Uh, let, calling with the best hands allows you to call slightly wider with hands that you don't necessarily want to get all in with. Can I talk about stack to pot ratio? We talk about that in the tournament master class. It's coming out soon. You don't. You wish Daniel Negreanu and Polk wouldn't be allowed to use data sheets when they start playing online. I think you mean charts. Understand that this is not your challenge. This is their challenge. The people who are participating in the challenge get to make the rules. The observers do not get to make the rules. All right. Let's go back to talking about what we're talking about today. Clarifying your thought process. This is going to sound bad, but a lot of the questions here that have been listed were because thought processes have not been clarified by all of you, or some of you here in the chat. Um, for example, earlier, you tell me that you've gone on a 15 by announce wing and you are sad and depressed about this, yet you've been a winning player for your whole life, 20 years, right? It's like, who cares then? Why would you care about a small down swing? You're telling me over 20 years, you just like gone straight up. I mean, that seems pretty impossible. I'm telling you that like, you have to ask like, why am I having that thought process? And um, I don't know, you gotta figure out why. You have to figure out why you have not sat down and done the math or ask yourself, why have I not treated poker professionally or anywhere near professionally over the last 20 years and spent all my winnings? You know what I mean? Like I'm not trying to pick on the person who asked this question. I'm just like trying to say, you need to make sure that you understand what you're doing and why. And then don't complain when you get the result that you're going to probably end up having. Um, what about people who say, like, why are small stakes, most small stakes players losing? Most poker players lose. Poker is a negative sum game. People think it's a zero sum game, but it's negative because of the rake. The rake goes to the casino. Now, of course, you could say, oh, the casino is a player. I want to employ all the people and let the casino owners take my money because, you know, they deserve it. Then short, right? You know, call it zero sum. Um, I would personally rather win money from poker than not, though. And it turns out that when the rake is high, more people lose, right? It's very important to recognize this. How did you build your bankroll? What made you make the move to stop whatever you were doing to play poker full time? I have a biography. Check out jonathanlittlepoker.com slash pokerography. What made, me make, what made me change from being a college student slash $10 an hour employee I started making about $200 an hour. <laughs> it turns out when you're making 20 times as much money as you could at your job, and if you were to get a degree, you'd be making a quarter as much money. The, the decision to go become a professional poker player is quite easy. But how did I build my bankroll? I played a ton. All you have to do to win money at poker, I'm telling you all, it's not that difficult. You have to find a game you can beat, play it a lot, keep a proper bankroll. It's all you got to do. It's all you got to do. Nobody wants to do that, though. People don't want to keep a proper bankroll. We already have people here saying, you know, I don't, I don't have a bankroll because I spend it all. People don't want to keep a proper bankroll. They want to spend it on nonsense. Back when I was a kid, I was friends with another poker player, and we were the only two good players in our local area. And every time he would win, he'd go buy a new CD. And after a year of this, he had a lot of CDs. But he had no money. After a year, I had a bunch of money and no CDs. So which would you rather have? He'd rather have CDs and no potential to earn substantial money in the future, right? Whereas I would rather have long-term success in poker. You have to decide what's important to you. Um, so you have to keep a proper bankroll. You have to find a game you can beat. Almost everybody, almost everybody, not the good winners, but almost everybody moves up until they lose. They can beat 1-3, but they want to play 2-5. Or they can beat $1,000 tournaments, but they want to play $5,000 tournaments. They move up until they can't win. And then that's where they struggle and they inevitably lose. Next, uh, play a lot. Most people don't want to play a lot. Most people want to play an hour a week and think that they're poker players. It's kind of like entrepreneurs and investors. If you look at uh, social media, people say, oh, I'm a poker player in my Twitter profile. And you know, maybe you are. If you play, play a hand of poker, I guess you are a poker player. But are you a serious poker player? Are you a professional poker player, etc.? And... Yeah, I mean, like trying to um, put terms like professional on poker players, irrelevant in my mind. People like to try to classify and qualify things. But I will generally say that, well, those three things are all you have to do. Find a game you can beat, play it a ton, have a proper bankroll. That's exactly what I did as a young person when I first started playing poker. I kept a very good bankroll for my games. I started with $50. I played very, very tiny stakes. And I always kept the adequate bankroll, often one and a half or two times the adequate bankroll because I never, ever, ever wanted to go broke. 
I did not want to go broke, so I kept a big bankroll. I probably moved up slower than I could have or should have, you know, if I was aggressive with the bankroll. But I don't care. I'd rather not go broke. Diet is very important. I think diet's relatively important. In terms of things in life, do I think diet's like the most important thing? I mean, probably not. It's certainly relevant though. You know, like you, you'd rather be in good shape than not. Under the gun limps, you're in the big blind, small blind limps as well, 10 4 2, small blind checks, you bet. Under the gun calls, you have the range advantage here. After you bet and get called, well, no, who knows what's going on here? We don't have clearly defined ranges. Also, when you bet and get called, I don't know what your betting range is, Kevin. This is not a clearly defined scenario at all. Dylan says, find a game you can beat, play it a ton. Strategy clarified. <laughs> it really is. That's all you got to do. And this is this applies to like all forms of investing in like anything. Find a game you can beat, play it a lot, keep a proper bankroll. People, people forget the proper bankroll. And to be fair, I don't always make that one clear. But you got to keep a proper bankroll because for like high variance investments, you need a much bigger bankroll than low variance investments, right? So that is relevant, but that's all you got to do. Playing a ton of volume means you need to be mentally tough. Well, you just have to not... The, the nice thing is that if you know that if you follow the formula, you're going to win. It's very nice to know that you are going to win. So, like, you, do you really need to be mentally tough to just know all you got to do is show up, play great, and win money? I mean, like, I don't think that actually requires much mental toughness. I think it just requires actually wanting to get what you want to get in life, right? You have trouble value owning yourself with pocket aces and also missing value with any advice. You're probably not playing them great. You're probably, I mean, basically if you're value betting too wide or whatever, I mean, I don't know, this, this is a weird question. You basically say you can't get value and you're value betting too thin. Like, I mean, this is not a great question. Give lots of hand examples, discuss them on the Discord. When you say play a ton, how much is that? For example, if we're, say, four table and cash games, four hours a day. I mean, again, what does a ton mean? It just means you're going to get your results faster if you play more hands, right? That said, if you have a bigger edge, in theory, you don't need to play as much to make the same amount of money, right? That said, what did Jonathan Little do? I mean, whenever I was young, from 18 to 21, well, 19 to 21, still had a job and was going to college when I was 18 for most of that year. 19 to 21, I played poker about 12 hours a day, every single day. I took one half of a day off each year for Christmas. So I took half a day off each year. I played 364 and a half days, 12 hours a day. I studied for four hours a day, every single day for three years. That's putting in good volume. I was 16 tabling the whole time and um, turned, you know, 50 bucks into a few hundred thousand. Now, when I was playing live cash games, what did I do? I sat at Bellagio from noon until midnight, sometimes a little bit later, noon until, you know, 6 a.m., seven days a week, every single day, because I wanted to make money, right? I was trading my um, social experiences for making money, which, you know, fine, good, do whatever you want, right? Probably not good for life balance, not good for bettering yourself as a human, but it's great for making money. And back then, as a young person, I assumed I needed to make some money, which may not necessarily even be true, but volume is relative, right? Volume is relative to some extent. I personally always err on the side of maximum volume because I realize if you put in a lot of volume, even with, with a tiny edge, you'll still win. That's the nice thing about a lot of volume is that you just you can't lose. You put in a lot of volume, you cannot lose. Whereas if you play with a big edge, but you don't put in any volume, you can still lose. Are the strategies that work better in micro stakes than higher stakes? Definitely. Your opponents in smaller taste games play worse. How long did you play Bellagio? 50, 60 hours a week. Um, wait, I don't know what you're asking. I just told you. I played literally 12 hours a day, every day, sometimes a little bit longer. So what's that? 80 hours a week? 70 hours a week? Something like that? But I don't care, right? I mean, show up and make your money. If you're going to pay me 100 bucks an hour to sit there and print money, show up and print your money, you know? Am I really uh, in such a great spot in life that I can turn down $30,000 a month? Probably not, right? Can you even find 16 tables playing at the same stake at the same time? You used to be able to play sit and goes like that, no problem. For sure, back in the day. You can still do it at small stakes. I mean, like, you can do it with, um, like, spin and goes. You can do it with Zoom poker. To be fair, like Zoom poker, I would definitely not recommend it. I'm not telling you to do this, but like you can find four Zoom tables, no problem. And that's about comparable to 16 regular tables. How many years did I do this? So I was doing it when I was traveling to play um, 
tournaments, I would usually travel to like travel about a week or two a month and then be home the rest of the time. Um, although I did stay home for like a, a half a year or something like that. So half a year of grinding hard there. And then I lived there for another two and a half or three years and I put in the same volume. What do you do if you have family and children, but you want to get better and study, etc.? You can't play more than two or three hours a day. Well, Gil, I hate to break it to you, but you are not going to be able to treat poker like a professional. Why? Because you don't have the resources available. A very vital resource is time. You have to be able to devote time to anything to get amazingly good. Now, Gil, maybe your goal is not to get amazingly good. I have plenty of friends who have great lives, great jobs, great families, everything, and they play poker once a month. And they want to get better. They're willing to spend, you know, two hours a week to get better. They play poker for four hours a week. And um, they know they're not going to be the best ever, but they want to be the best they can be, right? And they're smart about it. They don't play against the best players in the world. They play against their friends who also are doing the same thing. But Gil, if you have aspirations to become the best poker player in the world, and you're going to devote only two or three hours a day to it, then you're, hey, you're just not going to get there. I hate to break it to you. Because there are plenty of people out there who are substantially more hungry for it than you are because they don't have families and children and they're willing to devote literally all of their time to it, right? So that's okay. It's, under, it's Recognize that's not your scenario in life. You're not set up for that, but that's okay. Understand that poker is going to probably be more of a recreation for you that you can still make decent money from, 30, 50 bucks an hour, somewhere in there. And you have to ask, is it worth playing, learning, et cetera, to try to win 30 to 50 bucks an hour? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It's up to you to decide. All right, let's go back to clarifying your thoughts. Write them down. Get to where you can explain them to other people. Learning to speak somewhat eloquently. I'm, no, I'm not the most eloquent speaker. <laughs> um, I do my best, but I'm certainly not the greatest. And I appreciate all of you bearing with me whenever I'm stumbling over my words left and right. But if you can write things down in a clear way that people can understand, if you can explain things to people, it's going to go a long way to clarifying what you want and why you want it and how you go about getting it, right? Um, next, don't have ego problems. Learn from others. We discussed this, right? You want to make sure that whenever it becomes clear to you that you have done something wrong, wrong, incorrect, etc., for a long time, that essentially means that you have two options here. You can either keep doing what you did wrong in the past because you're unwilling to change, or... You can change, all right? So would you rather keep doing the same thing wrong just to stroke your ego to try to make yourself feel like you weren't wrong? Or should you realize I screwed up and that's okay? You have to be incredibly willing, incredibly willing to accept the idea that I screwed up and I was wrong about this. I've been wrong about plenty of things, I'm happy to admit it. And I'm actively trying to learn from others. I made a poker training site. I don't know if you heard about it. It's called pokercoaching.com where the whole purpose of this site, um, I'm trying to think of the right word. Not all that eloquent, am I? Uh, I I'm, I'm doing it to mainly help me get good at poker. I am charging you all a membership, letting you all give me money. I'm in turn giving loads of that money back to other world-class poker players to make content for you and for me. Selfish is the word. It's a little bit selfish because I am hiring the best coaches in the world to coach Jonathan Little. And in turn, I'm sharing that with all of you for a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the price. It's win, 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 win for everybody, right? Coaches get variance free money. They're happy to help too. I'll get to learn from them. You get to learn from them. Think of the value, right? It's like a no-brainer. And... Um, I recognize I do not know everything about poker, which is why I'm actively learning and studying from the elite poker players. I mean, just the other day we had a webinar with, um, brain's not working, Michael Acevedo and uh, Draft Ganger, where they were reviewing his uh, $10,000 buy-in win that he recently won 400,000 bucks in. And like, we have literally the best GTO player, wrote the book Modern Poker Theory on GTO Poker. And we have Giraffe Ganger, who is like the crusher, who's number one player in the world. These two guys talking strategy together, learning from each other, working together, collaborating, and they're letting you ex participate. They're answering the chat, you know, like this is what we are doing.
to improve. And like, that's what I want to learn from. So it's very, very important to um, learn from others and not be egotistical. So many people think I know everything. And if you know everything or you think you know everything, you're, you're going to lose. Also, I did a webinar the other day with Matt Affleck. I learned a few things from Matt Affleck in the webinar um, that's available at pokercoaching.com right there in the uh, classes tab, I think, where we reviewed his recent um, $250 win online where he won a World Series circuit ring. And there were a few spots where he ran bluffs that I did not, and he's thinking about things slightly differently. I learned about a, um, a tactic to learn which hands you should be bluffing with. It never really occurred to me. I mean, I just tried to memorize the charts, which, you know, I effectively did. But he has, like, um, ideas for ways to figure out which hands you should be bluffing with based on your opponent's three-betting range, which is cool. It's good to, know, good to know these little tips and tricks, right? And learning these tips and tricks is helpful and very beneficial. And he's, he's making webinars every week for the poker coaching members. So make sure you check that out. Is the tournament course going to come with the premium membership? Yes. Everything I make in terms of strategy video content goes into Poker Coaching Premium. Go to pokercoaching.com slash premium, check it out. Thousands and thousands of hours of content, GTO apps, downloadable charts, quizzes, courses, classes, private streams, whatever you want. So, four hours per day of studying and 12 hours per day playing live. Uh, that's, that's when I was playing online. Is this something, is that the same thing recommended for online? Well, that's what I did, yeah. I played, that's what I did back in the day. When I was playing live, I would just play live all the time because I was, I had, a, I had a very, very big win rate in the games to the point that I really was not spending a lot of time studying at that point. Not, not that that's necessarily ideal, but you have to realize as you get better and better at poker, you, in theory, don't need to be studying quite as much and you should instead just be extracting the value from the game. When you're not good at poker, you should be spending like all of your time studying because if you go play, you're going to lose your money. Is there a scenario where I put in half my stack and then fold? Like on the river, sure. Only 40 likes. You all don't like this content today? All right, we won't do it next time. Let's see. You're playing one through or most people raise gigantic. What's your strategy? Play tight. It's almost like there's no blinds. If there are no blinds, what should your strategy be if your opponents are all playing otherwise reasonably? Besides raising huge. Just be tight. Just be tight. It's easy to win when your opponents just want to put all their money in with nothing. It's really, 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 really easy. Check out our Facebook page. Yeah, we have a Facebook page. Uh, check out Poker Coaching there. It's updated daily. Lots of good content there, too. You get a study roadmap. Go to pokercoaching.com slash premium. Sign up. Get the, um, if you're a cash game player, go through the cash game course or the cash game, uh, what's it called? The cash game challenge. There's, a, I think, a 14-day cash game challenge. Nice, good, clear roadmap. Also, the cash game masterclass. Nice, clear roadmap. Um, for tournaments, there are tournament courses. And like I said, our tournament, um, tournament challenges where we give you something every single day to do in a nice linear manner. And also the tournament class is coming out very soon. It's going to be gigantic, like I said. All right, let's see. The other day you had a middle stack and an aggressive big stack on your right, two small stacks on your left on the bubble, resulted in you making tight folds. Any thoughts on this? Sounds like good poker to me. So listen, what all should you all start doing if you want to try to figure out what you want in life, what you want out of poker, or why you are losing at poker if you're losing, or why you're winning at poker if you're winning? I recommend you sit down and you try to write out why you're doing what you're doing in a particular spot. For example, let's say the button raises and you're in the big blind. Do you know your strategy there? Well, first things first, what stacks are we playing with, right? So now we have to write down how we're gonna play with all the various stack depths. So let's say 150 big blinds deep, 100 big blinds deep, 75 big blinds deep, 50 big blinds deep, 30, 20, 10, five, right? Go through there and write down all of those. Then, button raises, write down the raise sizing, because that'll, that'll change your answer. And then, write down your strategy in all those scenarios, right? And doing that will go a long way to helping you understand how you think about that scenario. And if you go through and do that constantly, for all spots, you are then going to have a very clear blueprint of why you do what you do. And the great thing about that is, is that you can then compare that to what other people do who you perceive to be better than you or to what a solver does and see if what you do is 
close enough to the right to where you can be happy with that, or if it's far off. Like, let's say all of your strategies are way far off from like simple pre-flop charts that we have at pokercoaching.com, then you're probably screwing up. And that's where you have to have no ego. You have to not have ego problems where you say, oh, I don't believe what math says. I think I'm right. Understand that if the math says you are wrong, unless you're massively exploiting your opponents who are doing something horribly bad, which, you know, could be a reason to deviate from GTO strategies. But if you are trying to play fundamentally sound and what you are doing is far off from it, you're probably screwing up. And if you're screwing up, you need to be willing to change. You must be willing to change. Craig says the poker coaching homework is great for that. Yeah, every single month we have a live homework webinar where I ask you how to play your entire range, pre-flop, on the flop, on the turn, all on the river. And the students who do that get good at poker. Students who don't do that, well, they don't get quite as good as fast. In bounty tournaments, can you play more hands? If you can collect the bounties of your opponents, then you should play more hands. If you cannot, you should not. Mark says you've been uh, crushing it since the pandemic. Good. I mean, I realize the pandemic's a horrible thing that's happened to the whole world, but it has given some of us who are willing to sit down and make good use of our time a bit more time to dedicate to the things that we actually want to get good at or the things we want to do. And, you know, I don't know how much longer people are going to be locked down. I see, like, England locking down again. Um, recognize that, yes, this is a bad time and a bad spot, but you can still make the most of it, right? This is a great time to clarify what you want. If you want to get good at poker and you're stuck at home, don't spend it watching Netflix and chilling. Spend it getting good at something. Get good at something. And if you have a job that you already love, you're like, oh, I already have a job. I don't need to get better at it. Uh, maybe you do. Maybe this is a great time to imp significantly improve your skills at it in some way, either by learning new information, by practicing it at home, whatever. Um, I mean, you know your situation better than mine. Uh, this is a spot where you have to make the most of this. You know, life throws you lemons, you make lemonade. Let's see. Who won the presidency? I don't think the presidency has been awarded yet. Plus it has, has it? I've been streaming for the last 45 minutes. Maybe it has. Kind of doubt anything's happening this early, though. Maybe Pennsylvania is awake right now. Pennsylvania could award it, I suppose. I'm actually not up to up to speed on the exact rules of determining who wins an election. Typically, it's pretty obvious. Seems like it's probably going to end up being pretty obvious this time. Let's see. You think I need to Google Netflix and chill? No, I think I know what I mean. Believe it or not, I mostly know what I'm saying. <laughs> Even if you all think I don't. All right, let's see. What's better to build a bankroll, turbo or deep stacked tournaments? Oh, so turbo tournaments have the value of being very quick. However, however, your edge is going to be minuscule. I will tell you that I have data from some backing sites that basically say that turbo tournaments are not really all that profitable. And if they are profitable, they're barely profitable. So instead, I would recommend you play the slower structured tournaments. Slower structured tournaments are probably going to be better to build a bankroll. That said, they're slower, right? Which implies you can't put in as much volume. Remember, be prop properly bankrolled, find a game you can beat, the slow tournaments, and play them a lot, right? The problem is you're going to not be able to play them a lot. There's value in tournaments being over quickly. You don't know if that's a value for you. Well, you can, you can play a ton of them, right? You're not going to have a big win rate, but you can play them a ton. Like back in the day when I played sit and goes, I was playing, you know, solid 100, 200 a day, something like this. It's 200 tournaments a day. It's a lot of tournaments. It's a lot of tournaments. So if we have 200 tournaments a day at a 2% return on investment, you're still just going to print money. So I have almost no edge, but I'm putting in so much volume to the point that you're like guaranteed to win, right? I ever play this, this, Mario keeps wondering about this team poker stuff. I mean, I've played various iterations of No Limit Holden tournaments. And I haven't really been a fan of many of them. That said, I did final table a World Series team event with my parents. So that was cool. We took ninth place. We immediately got it all in at the final table. We had ace-jack against ace-eight, and we lost. So that was fun. 
How have I been studying lately? Wait, how how have how have you been studying cash lately? Wink, wink. I have no clue why you're winking at me. But no, there's definitely value in being able to put in volume. You want to put in volume. Devin Jarvis in the house. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, so win by TKO. As uh, silly as a world of this is, I think this is probably the right, <laughs> the right uh, way to way to view this. You'll believe it when you see it, because um, well, if you've been paying attention for the last four years, uh, you'll believe it. You got you'll believe it when you see it. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. This is not the place to discuss the election. Well, don't worry, we're almost done here. Nothing really to discuss. Follow follow the um, reputable news sources. Should people range merge on the river? In some spots? Won't like selling a Tough No Limit audiobook be available? Um, soon. Soon. As far as I know, it's done. I finished it. I sat in a little box for 32 hours and I read it to you. And um, that's a lot of sitting and a lot of reading. So essentially, I did that. I had to go back and sit in the box for another hour to correct my little errors. And that was that. Does poker coaching offer spread limit information? No. Why? Because I want to make sure I'm teaching you games that have a future. I would be flabbergasted if spread limit games take over the world. So I do not recommend you spend time learning games that do not have much of a future, like um, Limit Hold'em, Five Card Draw, Deuce to seven, triple draw, right? These are games that, you know, they're played, but they're not really played. And certainly there's value in learning specific games, but I want to make sure you are investing your time learning things where you actually can win a substantial amount of money. And I understand that in some jurisdictions that you can only play spread limit games. I get that. But there really are fewer and fewer of those jurisdictions as time moves forward because they realize what a essentially dumb idea it is. <laughs> it's a dumb game. Uh, there's no reason to not let people play the no-limit varieties, right? What is spread limit? Essentially, some places have games where you can bet between two specific amounts. Like, say you're playing 1-2 no-limit, well, 1-2 spread limit. It'd be like 1-2, but then you can bet between like $2 and $20 on the flop and on the turn and on the river. So max bet is like 20 bucks. So on the river, the pot may be 150 bucks already, and you can only bet 20. So it plays a little bit closer to limit hold'em. <sighs> Let's see. Taminator says he joined Louis Philippe's study group. It's been really, really helpful and entertaining. Well, good. I'm glad to hear it. That's going to be starting really soon, actually. Check that out, pokercoaching.com. Click on the community tab. Go to the Discord. There's a lot of value in making friends, learning together, and bettering yourselves. And a great way to do that is to find a group of like-minded people who are all working towards the same goal. I mean, I did that whenever I was, well, still do it today when I'm learning poker. And um, basically, if you look at any world-class poker player, they have a group around them of other good poker players who are actively helping them improve their skills. So um, that's that. How do you become a pro? Find a game you can beat, play it a lot. Also, what is a pro, right? It's not all that hard to make, you know, 30k a month or 30k a year from poker. That's what, 3,000 bucks a month roughly. It's not all that much money. If you cannot make 30k a year playing poker, you're probably not trying hard enough. That said, I understand that um, a lot of people want to make way more than 30k a year. That's where you have to actually start to get good, pretty good at poker. That said, say you get to play two five no limit, right? Let's say you can make 50 bucks an hour, which is a fine win rate. Um, Definitely reasonable. I have many students who, are, who have that win rate or higher. So let's say you pl get, make 50 bucks an hour. Let's say you want to play, well, let's just say you're a regular human. You're not a robot like me. And you want to play 40 hours a week. It's $2,000 a week times, let's say, 48 weeks a year because you want to take some time off. That's $96,000 a year. Is 96000 bucks a year good for you? I don't know. For some people it is, for some people it isn't, Right? But it's not all that difficult to make 96K a year from poker if you sit down and actually put in the time. Most people don't want to sit down and put in the time, though. So how do you become a pro? Treat it like a profession. If you treat poker like a profession, you'll thrive. And if you don't, well, you won't. 
All right, that's me for today. Hope you all have a great day. Again, clarify your thoughts, figure out what you want and why. Ask yourself, why am I thinking the things that I am thinking? I mean, like, I, I view myself as a pretty logical, rational human. But even then, there'll be days where, or there'll be times where I'm like, why? I'll think some ridiculous thought. And then I'm like, why in the world would you think that? <laughs> it's like, it doesn't make any logical sense. Um, so you have, to, you have to get rid of these lo illogical thoughts. Realize you're always going to have them. But you have to kind of um, shuttle them away when they come and keep the thoughts that are logical. Like when you're playing poker, right? Say you get it all in and you lose with aces before the flop. Some people think, oh, man, I screwed up. Or, oh, man, I'm unlucky. Or, oh, you know, like they think things like this. But these thoughts are all irrelevant because he clearly didn't play it. Well, probably didn't play it poorly. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But, you know, you got it all in good, so who cares? Um, that's not a good, that's, that's not good logic either. Who cares? Let's presume you play the hand well and you lose. Some people still get annoyed when they lose thinking, oh, I should have, I should have won, but you're supposed to lose sometimes, right? Uh, they think things like, um, I'm unlucky, but you're not unlucky. I mean, we, we live in an amazing time in this whole existence of humans. So we're like basically the luckiest humans who've ever lived. And, um, life's good. Life's good. That's me for today. Have a great day. If you enjoyed this, click like, click subscribe. Again, check out the Poker Coaching Discord for the study group. That'll be starting up soon. Good luck in your games. Have a great, great day. Have a great weekend. And I'll talk to you next time.